Brazil, President Bolsonaro issues an ultimatum to the Supreme Court of Justice. In the U.S., President Biden signs an order to release FBI documents on 9-11. Cuba and Venezuelan athletes obtain gold medals at Tokyo Paralympic Games. Hello and welcome to Telesur, I'm José Daniel López in Quito, Ecuador, and this is From the South. Far-right Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro continues his attacks on Brazil's Supreme Court. Bolsonaro has issued a threat that demonstrations by his supporters, scheduled for Tuesday, will serve as an ultimatum to the Supreme Court of Justice he accused of acting against him. President Bolsonaro's personal attacks against the Supreme Court go back some time and come in response to the federal Supreme Court blocking some of his government's most conservative policies, launching investigations into several of his key allies, and green lighting a probe into his COVID-19 response. These one or two people have to learn their places. And the message from you, the Brazilian people, in the streets next Tuesday, the 7th, will be an ultimatum for these two people. After September the 7th, what will remain for all of us, with this giant demonstration of patriotism seen in all four corners of our Brazil, I doubt that those one or two who dare to defy us, defy the Constitution, disrespect the Brazilian people, will know how to return to their places. A Venezuelan government delegation has arrived in Mexico to resume talks with opposition sectors. The head of the government delegation, Jorge Rodriguez, noted that they have several proposals in hand, mainly focused on economic and social issues concerning the return of Venezuelan assets frozen or stolen abroad through U.S. sanctions, which are needed to, mode, to meet the needs of the entire population. Norway is acting as a mediator in the talks, while the Netherlands, Russia, Bolivia and Turkey participate as observers. Both the government and opposition delegations have thanked Mexico and Norway for supporting the process. The head of the Venezuelan government delegation participated in the talks with representatives of the opposition in Mexico has offered a brief remarks following the first session. We came here to find mechanisms so that all Venezuelan people may benefit from this dialogue effort. That is why we bring issues that directly affect the daily life of the Venezuelan people. Issues related to the economy, to the social care of the population, to the response to the pandemic. These are the fundamental issues that we bring here and I believe that this work will pay off. In Bolivia, the families of the victims of the Sencata and Sacaba massacres announced that they will continue their mobilizations to demand justice for the crimes that took place in November 2019. The protesters marched on Friday, noting that the mobilization brings together all the movements affected by the 2019 violence and added that they are preparing a national census to identify all the dead, wounded, detained and tortured during and after the coup a stage against President Evo Morales. They stress they need to accelerate the judicial process to punish those responsible. Meanwhile, judges rejected a request presented by Yanine Añez, defense team, for her release. The death toll after extensive flooding in the northeast of the United States caused by Hurricane Ida has risen to at least 49. The states of New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, Maryland, and Pennsylvania saw tornadoes, record rain, and flooding. President Joe Biden on Thursday issued emergency declarations in New York and New Jersey, allowing for federal aid. The toll was highest in New Jersey, where 25 people died in heavy rains late Wednesday and early Thursday, while six more are missing. A majority of people who lost their lives drowned after their vehicles were caught in flash floods, with some dying in the submerged cars and others getting swept away after existing excited into fast moving water. In Mexico, more than 560 homes were affected by heavy flooding in the municipality of San Pedro Telacope after Friday's storm. According to municipal authorities, more than 500 homes have been affected in eight neighborhoods of Telacapeque. However, they warn that this uh, represents barely 30% of damage count so far. In view of the situation, the government 
has set up some shelters to attend the people who cannot return to their homes. The Director of Civil Protection and Firefighters of Talacapé informed that the evaluation of damages and analysis of needs are being maintained in order to fund the restoration of the affected streets and homes. Here, the water came up to about 80 centimeters, but there on that side, it's about two meters. Some got into our house, but not a lot, because we managed to put some sandbags out, but things were really bad. About 540,000 children in the southwest of Haiti are now facing the possible re-emergence of waterborne diseases, the United Nations Children's Fund warned on Friday. The severe conditions in the southwestern part of the country, where over half a million children lack access to shelter, drinking water, and hygiene facilities, are rapidly increasing the threat of respiratory infections and malaria, according to UNICEF's representatives in Haiti. The official stressed that without urgent action, even cholera, which has not been reported since February 2019, could re-emerge. More news in a minute. Stay with us. Welcome back. China continues to lead the efforts to ensure COVID-19 vaccines for all nations. The Chinese foreign ministry explained that the vaccines produced by Sinopharm and Sinovac companies are scheduled to be delivered by the end of October and will be distributed in developing countries, especially in Asia and Africa. China has launched the initiative for Belt and Road Partnerships on COVID-19 vaccines of cooperation with 29 countries in a move to make further progress in a fair and a vaccine distribution worldwide. The president of Peru, Pedro Castillo, vowed to speed up the country's COVID-19 vaccination campaign among teachers in urban areas on Friday in order to facilitate a quicker return to in-person classes. Today is a joint effort between the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Education, authorities and teachers. All of us are making this effort to make this once and for all. Our students could take in-person classes soon. It is not the same doing it virtually than to have contact with the children how much we desire to be in front of our students. Still, we need to understand parents and children that first they should have the vaccine. Today we start with the teachers of the urban areas because more than 60% of teachers working in rural areas are already vaccinated. Cuba has begun conversations with the World Health Organization on the pre-qualification process for its vaccines against COVID-19 as announced by the president of the BioCuba Pharma Group, Eduardo Martinez. The scientist explains that the process follows the authorization for emergency use granted by Cuba's regulatory authorities for three of the domestically made vaccines against COVID-19, Soberana 2 Abdala, and Soberana Plus. The BioCuba Pharma Group which represents the biotechnology and pharmaceutical industry of the country, has maintained exchanges with Pan American Health Organization and WHO representatives on the development of its treatments and vaccines against the coronavirus through the pandemic. There is no disqualification. It is a whole process that takes some time. Those were the statements made by Dr. Carvajal Bosso yesterday, indicating that they are attentive to the evolution of the vaccines in Cuba and also waiting to share the information to start this process, which I repeat, takes a few weeks, if not months. We will evaluate the clinical and technical files, where there will be an exchange with the WHO and the Pan American Health Organization experts. Patients from the University Hospital of Guadalupe in Pointe Petrie are be being evacuated to mainland France to help take the pressure off hospitals struggling with the weight of COVID-19 cases. Twelve patients from Guadalupe were evacuated to mainland France on Friday to relieve the still very high hospital tension on the island. Although the numbers of patients admitted to the emergency unit of the Pointe Petrie University Hospital is decreasing, the hospital's intensive care units are still saturated with 46 patients in intensive care. In total, 73 COVID patients are in, in intense care throughout the archipelago since the start of the four wave. 52 medical evacuations have been carried out in order to relieve the different services according to the regional health agency. 
I feel relieved that my mother can leave. She's going to be able to have real care. She's going to be able to have a chance to live because nothing is safe here. Unfortunately, nothing is safe. They do everything they can, but nothing is certain. Today, we are doing two medical evacuations per island from the West Indies, Martinique and Guadeloupe. So that's 24 patients who are evacuated each week. That is 20% of the island's capacity. So it's a huge extraction margin. We will continue for as long as it takes and as long as the island is still saturated. The island is still saturated in terms of ICU places. It's a device that is already planned for next week. But if it needs to continue, depending on the needs, we will continue. The Chinese foreign ministry say that China is working to reach carbon neutrality in the shortest time possible. As the world's biggest developing country, China will achieve the world's reduction in carbon emission with the highest intensity in the shortest time in history. This fully demonstrates China's responsibility as a responsible major country. The United States should shoulder its responsibilities and conduct meaningful cooperation with other developing countries in the field of climate change. We hope that the United States side will view China and China-U.S. relationship in an objective and rational way. Remove the stumbling block on China-U.S. cooperation on climate change and push for more results in bilateral coordination and cooperation on climate change based on the principle of mutual respect, equality and mutual benefit. The world's biggest biodiversity summit since COVID-19 opened in the southern French city of Marseille on Friday. French President Emmanuel Macron urged world leaders and institutions to safeguard biodiversity as they work to curb climate change. The right for biodiversity is also an element that makes it possible to respond to the consequences of climate change and to move forward more quickly there too. These fights are essential fights not only for the good health of the planet, but for the survival of indigenous peoples, and therefore the fight for biodiversity against climate change. It is fighting for these people who, for centuries, sometimes millennia, have preserved these spaces that globalization has taken up. And so we can see clearly a virtual circle exists, and it is for a simple reason. Until now, we have also underestimated the economic impact of nature. The German capital of Berlin hosted the, its annual Festival of Lights display for the 17th time. Many projections and installations feature themes such as sustainability and carbon neutrality. The festival is taking place in various Berlin neighborhoods and includes the famous Brandenburg Gate and Potsdamer Square, as well as extending to train stations, ministries and embassies. The event runs through September 12th. And we have more stories coming up after one last break, so stay tuned. Welcome back. U.S. President Joe Biden has signed an order to release FBI documents on 9-11 attacks. Biden's decision to move on the executive order this week reportedly comes after 9-11 victims' families on Thursday as an inspector general in the Department of Justice to investigate their claims that the FBI lied about or destroyed evidence tying Saudi Arabian officials to the team of al-Qaeda hijackers. The executive order signed by Biden on Friday say that the full record will be disclosed in batches over the six months. Protesters have rallied in front of the presidential palace in Kabul to demand that the new Taliban leadership respect women's rights. The document, a document was distributed calling for Afghan women to be granted full rights to education and participation in the country's social and political fields. The Taliban has promised a more inclusive government that, than during its last rule between 1996 and 2001, but many remain skeptical. Afghan women saw limited progress during the 20-year foreign intervention and war, mostly con concentrated in Kabul. 
The situation for women in the rest of the country remains much the same, if not worsen, as they suffer the impacts of the conflict. They must make sure women participate in their government. We know that women form a majority of the population of Afghanistan. If they are not prepared in areas like education, health and politics, and do not have a role in these areas in our society, so the world will not recognize us. They will not hear our voice. We continue in Afghanistan where our collaborator Bak Jones brings us new information about the situation in the country. There are contradictory reports from Afghanistan about the reality of the situation in the Panjshir Valley. The Taliban movement confirmed its control over several important areas of the valley, while Panjshir tribal leaders make it clear that they have managed to repel the Taliban attack and that Panjshir is still under their control, not under Taliban control. This is one of the most complex security dossiers, especially considering that the U.S. agreement with the Taliban has not been accepted by several Afghan parties, such as Panjshir leaders and other Afghan leaders who led the country, such as Amrullah Saleh, former Vice President and former President Ashraf Ghani's administration, who continue to insist on fighting the Taliban, so much so that they considered them as an occupying force to be dealt with. Pakistan sent a high-level intelligence delegation to the Afghan capital, Kabul, headed by General Faiz Hamid Chowdhury, to discuss issues of major national security concern. The main theme is border security, and armed insurgent organizations such as ISIS Daesh and Baloch rebel groups that have taken refuge in Afghanistan. The Pakistani delegation will also discuss with senior Taliban officials ways to enhance security and intelligence cooperation. This visit is believed to be the first of its kind from the Pakistani side and is of great importance to both Pakistan and Afghanistan. This coincides with an accelerated Chinese-Afghan reapproachment, especially after Taliban spokesman Sabihullah Muhammad announced that China is now considered Afghanistan's main partner, which shows that there are important agreements to be implemented soon between Afghanistan and China, which could include Afghanistan in one of China's most gigantic One Road, One Belt projects. International experts praise China for sharing technological achievements with countries along the Belt and Road, saying that improvements in digital trade services will boost the development of many economic sectors. The remarks follow pre President Xi Jinping's speech at the Global Trade in Services Summit of 2021, China International Fair Trade for Trade Services. In his speech, Xi said China will create more possibilities for cooperation by scaling up support for the growth of services sector in Belt and Road Partners countries and by sharing China's technological achievements with the rest of the world. How these technologies can be used to really improve the way we operate today, uh, I think that China is going to be playing a very, very significant role in this respect. And, uh, and, and this is going to impact on uh, travel, it's going to impact on tourism, it's going to impact on manufacturing, it's going to impact even on exploration, whether it is mineral exploration in the ground or space exploration, because these technologies are technologies that have the capacity to be able to give us information and data that the eye cannot see, but that technology can uncover. In other news, Latin America shows its sports potential at the Tokyo's Paralympic Games with the latest gold medals obtained by Cuba and Venezuelan athletes. Cuban Omar Duran broke the world record of the 200 meters and conquers its third gold medal after having obtained the first place in the 100 and 400 meters in athletics. Meanwhile, Venezuelan Lisbeli Vera won her second world gold medal in the 200 category T47. With only one day to end the Tokyo's Paralympic Games, Venezuela seals its best participation in this competition with seven medals, three gold, two silver and two bronze. And we come to the end of this news brief, but remember you can find this and many other stories in our website at English.net. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Jose Daniel Lopez. Thank you for watching.